are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What is the first article of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger, guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only as a fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. <coughs> For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Thus far the Catechism. I am happy to see that there were at least some looks of familiarity with that while I recited it to you. The part of the meaning of the first article of the Apostles' Creed to which I, call, I wish to call your attention is the part where it says, God has given me my body and soul. There is a debate raging in Western civilization. It has been raging for over 2,000 years. In Western civilization, we argue about which is more important, the body or the soul. The argument has manifested itself in many ways down through the ages. Sometimes we favor the soul and sometimes we favor the body. The argument has been raging over a thousand years. It goes back to our ancient Greek ancestors. Plato, before the time of our Lord, taught that the soul is more important than the body. In fact, he taught that the soul was so important that your soul is the real you. He taught that your body was just a shell. He taught that your soul could go from one body to another and you would still be you. Plato taught that when the body died, the soul went to some sort of heaven and drank from the waters of forgetfulness. This is a metaphor, you understand. And then after the soul had forgotten everything, it was reborn into a new body, but it was still the same soul. By teaching this, Plato taught that the body was disposable, that the soul could go from one body to another and it would remain the same person. For you Doctor Who fans, this is how the doctor can go from one body to the next and remain the same person. For you X-Men fans, I remember a cartoon when I was a kid where they fought a monster that swallowed people's souls. When the monster swallowed somebody's soul, the body died. As soon as the X-Men defeated the monster, all the souls that it had swallowed went back into their bodies and everybody lived again. For some of you older Disney fans, the movie Freaky Friday is about a mother who wakes up in her daughter's body and the daughter wakes up in her mother's body. And the daughter has to go to her mom's work and face all of the challenges that her mother faces at work. And the mother has to go to school and face all of the challenges that her daughter faces at school. It's a cute movie. It teaches us to look at things from another person's perspective. However, the movie is rooted on the assumption that a mother and daughter can exchange bodies, that their soul can go from one to the other and they remain the same person. All of this comes from Plato. I recently watched, rewatched all of my old Kirk and Spock DVDs. And the very last episode features a machine that can exchange people's souls. This idea comes from Plato. It says that the soul is the real you. The soul is the only thing about you that counts. The soul is the only thing that is 
the vacuum that is eternal, your body is disposable. Thus far, Aristotle. I'm sorry. Thus far, Plato. Aristotle is the next point in the outline of my brain. So Aristotle, also the time before the time of our Lord, he said the body was more important than the soul. The reason that he said that the body was more important than the soul was because he said everything is just material. Do you remember fifth grade science class? I learned about Aristotle. He said everything is just pile. Everything is material. There is no such thing as the spiritual. Those things that you and I consider to be spiritual are simply manifestations of our physical bodies. Like the evolutionists of today, Aristotle said we are nothing but our bodies. There is no soul. People buy into that nowadays. Have you heard the testimony of those who have died in hospitals and then been resuscitated? Do you know how often they testify that they saw themselves floating above their own bodies, looking down on their bodies? That testimony is quite consistent. It would seem to indicate there's a soul, but those people who follow Aristotle's line of thinking say, no, no, that is a hallucination brought on by the firing of the neurons in the brain as it dies. For them, we're just bodies. There is no soul. The experience that we have of spiritual things is nothing more than the interaction of the electrical impulses of our brains. We are complicated molecular machines, they say. Complicated enough to think about things like the soul without there actually being any. For Aristotle and his followers, you are only bodies. There is no soul. The only thing that counts about you is your body. There is no soul. The only thing you should care about is your body. There is no soul. So who's right? Is Plato right? Or is Aristotle right? Is the soul more important than the body? Or is the body more important than the soul? All of Western civilization must stand in all before the risen Christ. All of our arguments with which we have argued for the millennia must be settled at the feet of the risen Christ. For it is only the risen Christ who can give us the correct answer to all things. It is only the risen Christ who can love us properly and tell us who we are. So what does the risen Christ say about the body and the soul? People brought to Jesus a paralytic. When they laid the paralyzed man in front of Jesus, he saw their faith and he said to the paralyzed man, Child, your sins are forgiven. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not record for us what the reaction of the paralyzed man was. What went through his mind as he laid there paralyzed before the Lord and the Lord said, Your sins are forgiven. I must confess that I must be something of an evolutionist because when I try to place myself in the position of the paralyzed man and listen to my Lord say to me, your sins are forgiven, I think I would have said to my friends, I thought we came for a healing. Can you get me to a real doctor? All this guy wants to do is forgive me of my sins. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do not record what the reaction of the paralyzed man was. And their lack of record in regards to the reaction of the paralyzed man must give some indication that he received the word of the Lord. I actually think that on this point, the episodic presentation of our Lord's life known as the chosen has it right. Because the chosen is using a visual medium in presenting the Lord's life, they have to show you the reaction of the paralyzed man. When the actor pretending to be the paralyzed man hears the actor portraying Jesus deliver the line, child, your sins are forgiven, the actor portraying the paralyzed man goes like this. As if to say thanks. 
as if to say, I understand why it is that you are saying that. I appreciate you for giving me of my sins. And then Jesus says, stand up and walk. The reason the paralyzed man understands what Jesus is doing is because he has read his Bible and he understands it. Do you not remember the first covenant? Do you remember the stipulations of the first covenant? The chief stipulation of the first covenant is you shall have no other gods. Do you remember the rewards that God has promised you if you keep that stipulation? If you keep that stipulation, God has promised you lots of children, a good yield in the field, and good health. If you fail to keep that stipulation, God has promised you few children, no yield in the field, and ill health. <coughs> Jeremiah is one of the greatest preachers of the first covenant. Jeremiah has a slogan that he repeats over and over again. Go home today and this afternoon, read through the prophet Jeremiah, and count the number of times he mentions the sword, famine, and plague. If you're reading in the ESV, it's probably pestilence. Okay, so the sword, famine, and pestilence. He says it over and over again. We have violated the stipulations of the first covenant. We have built idols in the temple. And Jeremiah says, the just penalty for what you have done is the sword, famine, and pestilence. Therefore, disease is a penalty against our sins. It is part of the decay with which the creation is beset. Romans chapter 8 says that God has subjected the creation to decay. He has subjected it to decay when he said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it. It will produce thorns and thistles for you until you return to the dust of the ground. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. If sickness is not part of the decay with which the creation is beset, I do not know what decay is. Even when someone has something as simple as the common cold, they do not function the way God created them to function. That's the decay. Death is simply the culmination of that decay. It is part of the penalty for violating the first stipulation of the old covenant. You shall have no other gods. And so the paralyzed man receives his forgiveness with joy. He knows why he's paralyzed. He knows why he's lying on that mat. And he knows why Jesus is telling him, your sins are forgiven. And then Jesus says, stand up, take your bed, and go home. I've taken you through this exercise before. But I think it's worth taking you through it again. Jesus tells the paralyzed man to stand up, take his bed, and go home in order to prove that he has authority on earth to forgive sins. Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say stand up and walk? Since the forgiveness of sins is not visually verifiable, it is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. If I were to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, no one would be, no one would be able to tell otherwise. But if I were to say to a paralyzed man, stand up, take your bed, and go home, that can be visually verified. If he does not stand up, take his bed, and go home, I will appear to be mocking him. Therefore, it is more difficult to say, stand up, take your bed, and go home. Your Lord is reasoning from the difficult to the easy. If your Lord can lift 150 pounds, he can surely lift 75. If your Lord can do that which is difficult, your Lord can do that which is easy. If your Lord can say to the paralyzed man, stand up, take your bed, and go home, then the Lord can say, your sins are forgiven. And so he says to the paralyzed man, stand up, take your bed, and go home. And he stands up, he takes his bed, and he goes home. 
The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He has authority on earth to love the soul. And he loves the soul precisely by loving the body. He is the God who breathed into Adam the breath of life after he had formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And he is the same God who breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The same God who breathes physical life into you is the same God who breathes into you the forgiveness of sins. He does not love your body and neglect and ignore the soul. He does not love your soul and neglect and ignore the body. He loves you as he made you. He loves you body and soul. <coughs> this is why he has instructed this in James chapter 5. If anyone among you is sick, let him call the elders, that is the pastors of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous person has great power. Do you wish to be cured of your diseases? Then confess your sins to one another, and you will be healed. When the soul is sick, the body is soon sick with it. And when the body is sick, the soul is soon sick with it. And when the soul is healed, the body is healed. And when the body is healed, the soul is healed. That is why your final salvation is a resurrection from the dead. When your bodies rise, the final healing will be upon you. When your bodies rise, the forgiveness of your sins, which he has given you, will be manifested in your flesh. This is how your Lord loves you. This is why your Lord does not simply go around preaching. Your Lord dies on a cross. Your Lord does not go around with mere platitudes. He rises from the dead. Your Lord does not say simply to be happy, things will be better. Your Lord makes things better. He is the creator of all things. He loves both your body and your soul. He will not neglect the one. He will not neglect the other. What you have in the incident of the paralyzed man is a microcosm of our Lord's entire ministry. When it comes to the paralyzed man, he makes it evident that forgiveness and healing come together. Yet his entire ministry is characterized by him going around forgiving sinners. His entire ministry is characterized by him going around healing the sick. He is here to remove the penalty for your sin. That's what forgiveness is. When you forgive somebody, you take away the penalty that you hold against them. When God forgives you, he takes away the penalty that he holds against you. And what is the penalty? For your violation of the stipulations of the Old Covenant, sickness, decay, death. And Jesus came and removed them all. He forgave sinners and told them, take heart, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He healed lepers and said, take heart, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And he raised the dead and gave them back to those whom they loved. This is how your Lord loves you. He loves you body and soul. This is how he calls you to love each other. He calls you to love each other body and soul. 